to shine as the stars. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. I hope you've been able to go out and look at the stars lately and just be reminded of all that the Lord has shown us, all that the heavens have declared. I went out last night and took this picture of Jupiter in Libra and also Scorpius there on the left. You could see and be reminded of the story that we've been learning about that the heavens have declared over the past few years. And it reminds us that we've been brought to this place where we are right now. We are awaiting our Redeemer, the one who redeemed us, the one who offered himself on our behalf. And that's the whole story of Libra, the altar. And the heavens have rehearsed the story of the Redeemer, the Lamb of God, the light who did come on our behalf. And so we're at a time where we're awaiting our beloved and we remember the story that the heavens have declared, but we can still look up even now and be reminded that this story is still ongoing and it's still being pointed to at this very moment. Because this is a time of expectation, a time of remembering the offering at the altar, the one who is offered on our behalf, and reminds us right now that our Redeemer is coming to pick up the purchased possession. And in many ways, it also tells us that there is more to the story. We've learned about this before and talked about it in the Heavens Declared booklet. We're expecting it to change to the next chapter of the story. And we know the story continues because there are more events that are going to happen prophetically. We know that our Redeemer, the Son of Man, is coming to pick up his bride. But we also know that the Son of Perdition will be coming right after that and the tribulation events will start. So we know and we can see that even in this picture, right now declared in heavens, that we should be expecting a chapter change to take place, but also expecting what comes before that can take place. And so as you look up into the heavens right now, you can be reminded of the Redeemer, the one who offered himself, but also that this is the time of the expected pickup of the purchased possession. And the heavens right now are pointing to the altar, Libra. And we talked about before, this was the ancient understanding that and this is what we've been looking at particularly. What was the ancient understanding, particularly at the time of the early church? What did they understand these promises in light of what the heavens declared? How would they look at it and see what the heavens were declaring? And this gives us the best understanding for today, especially when we can note from Scripture particular historical astronomical perspectives that the apostles, such as Paul, had about the stars and astronomy and the ecliptic and all that. And so we have to keep in mind that they viewed Libra as an altar overlapped though with the scorpion scorpius and that's often depicted in ancient writings and inscriptions they knew that these two constellations overlap and considering that paul quoted from the foremost authority on astronomy at that time we know his perspective and the early church's perspective as well and so when we look at libra today we have to keep in mind that the scorpion also starts in this exact same place because they overlap Particularly with it understood that the two claws of Scorpius go all the way to the two brightest stars on the right of Libra. So all the way on the right of Libra, that's where the scorpion started in their understanding. So keep that in your hip pocket. We'll come back to that later. But now is a time when we consider where we are right now. We review what led us to this point, And that gives us further understanding for what comes next. We'll understand where we are right now and what comes next when we understand the whole story that's being told. And so that's why I highly encourage you, download The Heavens Declared. You can find links in the description box for the poster as well as the booklet version. The booklet version is easier to print out and read and share with others. But this is why we review. We're not at the end yet. Our Redeemer hasn't picked us up yet. We know this is a time of expectation, but we review and we have our faith strengthened that we are where we're supposed to be because the signs have led us here. You know, I was talking with a friend just the other day about these signs and how there's times of waiting in between different high points of the signs and the celestial story. But when we review the story and we know where we are, we have total faith that we are where we're supposed to be. This is a time of expectation. I don't need more signs to tell me my redemption draweth nigh. I've seen the story. It tells me he's nigh. So I can get busy with what I'm supposed to be doing, and that's what I have been doing. Different things that the Lord has impressed upon me to do, particularly with the medical missions. We can go forward in our faith, in our everyday life, our duties, our responsibilities as Christians and ambassadors right now, because we know we are at the time. And so this is why we review. We're essentially looking at the engagement ring, reminding us that our bridegroom is coming to pick up his purchased possession. And heavens are still, right now, declaring this same promise. 
and in many ways when we overlap it with the other promises and understandings about this time the biblical perspective and the season understanding that further strengthens our faith when we see this is the time after the wheat harvest after the barley harvest this was the time when ruth the gentile bride when she was redeemed this is when her bridegroom went away to redeem her and he was coming back quickly to get her and so we see these same pictures at this time too we're waiting our bridegroom who has already purchased us he's given us an earnest a promise that he is coming back just like boaz gave ruth the barley that was a earnest showing that he was good for his promise he was going to redeem her likewise we're at the same time the same picture we are awaiting our bridegroom to come and pick up the purchased possession and when we look at the timeline, we can see even the agricultural pictures that are used throughout Scripture, particularly even the Song of Solomon. And definitely check out the timeline. We do update it every single day, and I've added a lot of agricultural information. The Bender family has been giving us the different picture updates from the grapes and the figs last year and also this year. And so that gives us a really good feel for the agricultural season, when grapes are ready, when the figs are going to be ready. The grapes are still green as grass right now. The figs are still green as grass right now, too. We're in a season, even though it's technically and astronomically the early part of summer, it's still within the picture described in Scripture of when the bride is awaiting her bridegroom, awaiting her beloved to call her, rise up, my love, and come away. So definitely check out the timeline. There's a lot of very interesting things that tell us this is an amazing time of expectation. And we couple the agricultural understanding, the historical understanding, the biblical understanding with the current ongoing celestial understanding. We look up, we lift up our heads, and so much coming together telling us this is a time. We looked at it before. We saw the heavens declare, and that told us our redemption draweth nigh. That was a while ago. We're here now at summer, which was the parallel illustration often used with different parables he gave about the fig tree. That's a similar signal that summer is nigh. So there is an understanding in all these signs. There is a time gap, a delay, where you get nigher, you get closer to the final mark, with summer being a picture of the final mark. Well, here we are now at the end of the nigh period. We're here at the summertime, the early summertime. So right here, we're at the target zone, you could say, of the expectation of him coming any moment. This excites us because we can say we are here where we were told we were going to be nigh to. We're here now. Great expectation at this time. And when we have this expectation and this faith, we can be encouraged so much to run for the prize, to finish strong, and this is what we need to do. Keep our eyes on the prize. What is the prize? The prize is Jesus Christ. To know him more, to know the power of his resurrection, he is the prize. And we live our life in light of his promises, of his coming, of the prophetic time. We see it all coming together and it changes how we live. We live for our beloved. Daniel 12, 3 And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. This is a beautiful promise in the Old Testament that was given to Daniel regarding the last times, where we are right now. And of course, that couples and continues with the same admonitions to be wise, to be faithful. That's how he wants to find us. The greatest promises for Christ's servants are for the wise. Notice that he emphasizes it's the wise that will shine as the brightness of the firmament. It's the wise and those that turn many to righteousness, those who live in light of the time and live for their Redeemer, those who exhort and provoke each other into love and to good works, those who strive and push each other to live for their Lord, to live godly. In this present world, those that do will shine as the stars forever and ever. There are special promises and God uses the brightest pictures that we can see in our natural realm. He compares it to the stars, to the firmament, the sky, the heavenly dome. He compares it also in Matthew to shining as the sun. He compares the greatest rewards that he has for those who are wise, those who live for him, those who live godly. He compares that to the brightest things we can imagine. And that is how they will shine. Those that shine bright for their Lord and how they live will shine. It will be reflected in their life for all of eternity. Too many Christians are content just to stay at the starting line. No, the greatest promises are going to be far beyond what you can not imagine. That's the picture he's trying to convey to us. The promises and rewards are so much more than you can imagine. You take the brightest thing you can imagine. And that, that's an idea of how much he is going to reward those that are wise. The wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. It gives us in Revelation multiple pictures and promises of the greatest rewards are going to be for the wise, for his bride. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. 
He wants us to overcome. He wants us to resist temptation. There is a prize for those that do. There are crowns for those that do. For those that don't push themselves to live for their Lord, those who are content to stay at the starting line, those that don't want to overcome the flesh and the devil, they will stay there. They will not rule. They will not have a crown. There are rewards for those who are wise, for those who are faithful. And he uses the brightest pictures that we can see and imagine in our realm today to give us an idea that the rewards are going to far outshine anything we can imagine. Let's not shortchange ourselves just to say, I'll be content to be in heaven. No, let's press for the prize, the prize of Jesus Christ. And when we're at a time where we are expecting our Redeemer and that he's going to be coming and he's going to be rewarding every man according as his work shall be, we need to keep in mind this picture of how the wise who do shine bright, God compares them to the stars. And so this should catch our attention as we're studying what the heavens are declaring. Do we see this picture of shining bright in the stars? Do we see that in the line that's being declared in the story that we've been seeing so far? Psalm 19.1 The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Incredible pictures about how the heavens do declare the glory of God, and they show, they demonstrate his handiwork. It's done on purpose. He wants us to look up at it and appreciate it and understand what is being declared there. It showeth knowledge. It demonstrates intelligence. There is an intelligence to the movement. There is a deliberateness. There is a choreography. And it should catch our attention when he tells us what the major pictures are even related to. He tells us that their line has gone out through all the earth. And that's the ecliptic line that the major actors on the celestial stage travel along. That's how the story changes along that line. And so we know where to be looking to tell the main points of the story. It's along the ecliptic. And he compares the sun, particularly, is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And so this should catch our attention where we're at a time where we're expecting our bridegroom. And we understand by looking up and lifting up our heads, we will know that our redemption, our redeemer, our bridegroom, our beloved, he's coming for us. So we should be expecting that we should be seeing this picture in the heavens as part of the story. Because it will tell us our redemption draweth nigh. And that should also include the timing when we should be expecting him at any moment too. And notice it also compares it as a strong man to run a race. And this should remind us particularly of the emphasis that the Lord has impressed upon us lately with running for the prize. God has given us meat. He's given us understanding. He's given us wisdom about this time. We don't need a million videos every single day. He's given us meat to chew on. Chew on for weeks. To tell us this is what we need to be doing. When we know what we are supposed to be doing. When we know the time. When we know he's nigh. We don't sit around just doing nothing. We do what we're supposed to be doing. So we will be found wise and faithful servants. Who are occupying till he comes. When he comes he wants to find us in the middle of doing what we're supposed to be doing. Living the way we're supposed to be living. So we have this picture even coupled with the bridegroom. The idea of him running a race. The bridegroom is running. But we are also running too. We are running for the prize. And we talk about in the booklet, definitely print it out, definitely read it. Paul understood he was in a race. Even though he was saved, even though he was a believer in Jesus Christ, he understood he was still in the race. He had not obtained the prize yet. The prize goes beyond the gift of salvation. What is the prize? He explains the prize is Jesus Christ, to know him more than when he started his race. The mark is the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul laid it out. He said, Jesus Christ is the one who apprehended me. He's the one who loved me. He's the one who died for me. He's the one who drew me. He has been in a race toward me. He's been running toward me. And because he has apprehended me, because he has chased after me, I will love him because he first loved me. I will race toward him. That's the incredible thing about having a true perspective of what this race is. Jesus Christ is still racing toward us. He wants us to be in a close relationship toward him if we will rise up and draw nigh to him. The race is going both ways. We should be going toward him, and when we do, he will draw nigh to us, and he will come in and he will sup with us, if that's what we want. The race goes both ways. Both sides are running. The son as a bridegroom is also running as a runner in a race as well. He's running toward his bride. His bride then should run toward the bridegroom.
And that is the picture that he gives in scripture, particularly of the ten virgins. The bride is going to be called out of the body of Christ. The bride is the ones who are close to the heart of Christ, just like Eve was called out of the body of Adam. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, is going to have his bride from out of his body, the wise and faithful servants, those who made themselves ready, those who rose up and went out to meet the bridegroom. He paints so many beautiful pictures in scripture of the race and the runners who are running, those who are drawing nigh to each other. This is the whole parable of the ten virgins. All ten were invited. All ten could have gone in, but only five shone bright. Only five rose up to go out to meet the bridegroom. The other five went the other way. That's the whole picture. And so it's a picture of a race. The bridegroom cometh. We know the bridegroom is racing toward the bride to pick up the bride. Are we, as the bride, rising up, trimming our lamp, shining bright, and running out to meet him? The race goes both ways. That's a picture going on here. Are we rising up? The bridegroom cometh. Go ye, run toward the bridegroom. This is a picture that we're told the heavens declare. This is the picture of the sun. This is what the sun is as. A bridegroom, but also a bridegroom who's running as though he's in a race to get something. What is any race to get? They that be wise. That's who he's coming to get. Those who are wise, those who go out to meet the bridegroom. They shall shine. They're already shining. Because they are already shining, they shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. That's going to be their eternal reward because they shone bright for the one that they loved. And they that turned many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Beautiful, beautiful pictures. And so again, this should get us to think when we're at a time where we're expecting our bridegroom and we've seen the heavens declare the story of our Redeemer, the one who purchased us, declare it in detail, even to the sum of the story. And we see apparently that the chapter is about to change. We should also expect to see at this time of expectation even further pictures of the bridegroom coming to pick up the wise, those who are shining bright. Now we know who the bridegroom would be represented by. That's the sun, who's also running a race. So let's think here for a moment. In the heavens, along the line that they declare, what would best declare the wise who are shining bright? Well, if they're going to be pictured by stars and shining bright as the firmament, and even Matthew talks about shining bright as the sun, it would follow that the best picture of the wise in the story is going to be the brightest stars that are along the line. Would it not? Yeah. And we know the book of Revelation talks about Pleiades, which is the seven stars, but that is a picture of the entire church. Notice in the book of Revelation, he says that's all seven churches, and that's used to paint a picture of all the churches from the good to the very bad, too. So Pleiades is a picture of the churches, all of the body of Christ, but not exclusively of the bride. It's also interesting if you go outside and look at Pleiades, it's not the brightest constellation to see. It's kind of hard to see sometimes too. It's there, but you got to be looking for it. And Jesus said he's coming for the wise who are shining bright. So the picture for the wise should far outshine Pleiades. But what would picture the wise? If Pleiades pictures all of the churches, then what would picture the wise? We know the bridegroom is as the sun, so that's going to picture the bridegroom and how he's running a race. So what would be the brightest stars that are in the night sky, that are in the heavenly dome declared every single day? But when we look at the night sky, particularly in the area of Orion, and we do look at Pleiades, we can be reminded of Pleiades, we'll also find something in the same view that is also shining bright. All the way on the other side. It's actually in a straight line, and it's often used to find Pleiades, because again, Pleiades does not shine all that bright by itself. So often people will recommend look for this very bright star over here. My camera's a little blurry. It's not the best. But this star over here and then you follow the three stars in the belt of Orion and that will generally lead you straight toward where you can expect to find Pleiades. And this is how people find Pleiades because it's kind of faint. It's often hard to find by itself. So you look for the brightest star in the night sky then Orion and that'll lead you straight to Pleiades. So when you know where Pleiades is also, you should know where the brightest star in the heavens is. Right over there. What is the name of that star and how bright is it compared to the other stars? Oh, when we look up brightness of the stars, it talks about the brightness of Vega is exceeded by four stars in the night sky at visible wavelengths and more at infrared wavelengths, as well as the bright planets Venus, Mars, and Jupiter, and these must be described by negative magnitudes. For example, Sirius, the brightest star of the celestial sphere, has an apparent magnitude of negative 1.4 in the visible. 
All right, when you go outside and look at the stars, there's a lot of bright stars. And so astronomers, in order to classify and rank them by magnitude, they pick the star Vega as the baseline. All stars are going to be compared to Vega because that's a bright star and it really doesn't change in its brightness. But they do note that there are still four stars in the night sky that are going to be brighter than Vega. Vega is the baseline that has a magnitude of 0.0. .0. Everything else is compared to that. But since there are four stars that are brighter than Vega, they are marked out as extra bright by a negative sign. That's just how they do it. But they mention that Sirius is the brightest star of the celestial sphere, brighter than Vega, with an apparent magnitude of negative 1.4 in the visible. That's how it appears to the naked eye. And so when we look at a chart of the brightest stars, notice at the top is the sun. And that's regarded as a star, even though creation account does say he made the stars also. The sun really, from a biblical perspective, is its own object. It's not a star from a biblical perspective. But the sun is regarded as the brightest star. And you'll see that Vega, it's basically 0.0. .0. They round it off to a degree. That's the baseline. But there's four brighter stars in that with Sirius being the brightest star in the night sky. And also notice that Sirius, with a magnitude of 1.46, is twice as bright as the next brightest star, Canopus. So Sirius is unique in that it's the brightest star, but it also stands out from even the brightest of the brightest stars. This should get us to think, because Sirius is a very famous star, very well known. It's very hard to miss when you're outside, when you look at Orion. That's how you find Pleiades. So it's very well known, and it's well known that it's twice as bright as even the next brightest star. And so when the promise was given to Daniel, who was an astronomer, that the wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, the heavenly dome, and as the stars, Sirius would be the first one to come to mind. Now I'm aware about the Freemasons and about their interpretations of Sirius and all that. That does not matter for us. There's plenty of videos out there that cover that. We're not covering that here today. We've talked about it before. Today we're looking at what's the biblical understanding of what the heavens are declaring. That's what we're looking at in this picture of how the wise shall shine as the brightest stars, as the firmament, as the sun, the brightest objects in the sky, in the firmament. That's a picture used. And Sirius we can see as a picture of the brightest star and the sun as a bridegroom. You know, the sun shines during the day, obviously. The sun's out. So that's the brightest during the day, Sirius is the brightest during the night of the stars. So if we're going to look for a picture of the bridegroom, who's the sun, coming for the wise, pictured by Sirius, we should be looking into the heavens of when does the sun line up with Sirius, shouldn't we? That'd fit the picture, the two brightest objects coming together. Well, when we look on Stellarium, July 6th, the sun is going to be in Gemini. This is an interesting picture of what that represents, the bride and the bridegroom. So it's going to be in Gemini, drawing attention to that. At the same time, it's going to be in line with Sirius. The sun and Sirius will have the same longitude out on that day. And that's in just a few days right here when we're expecting our bridegroom to come for his bride. And this is what we see even hinted at in the ecliptic that the heavens are declaring. The bridegroom and the bride, the bridegroom and the faithful and wise bride. We see this picture being declared, pointed out, drawing attention to all, both of them at the same time. Again, review the Heavens Declared book. This is why we print out these, because it comes in handy reviewing new things that the Lord shows us about what the Heavens are declaring right now that go on top of the story we've already seen, because we also know there's future chapters as well. On page 11, 12, and 13, we talk about the historical understanding of Gemini. The greater understanding for that constellation was of a man and a woman, an Adam and an Eve, a bride and a bridegroom. That's what Gemini was well understood to be the most. And so it should get your attention that this is what the heavens are pointing to right at this point in the story where we are expecting our bridegroom, who's running a race toward us, who's apprehending us, and we should be running toward him. Genesis 1.14 And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And so this is incredible. God wants us to look at what the heavens are declaring. We look at it from a Christian and a biblical perspective. We don't go into astrology. That's Satan's distortion of what God created. We look at it from a biblical perspective. But we understand it's given for specific things. The very lights in the firmament that are alluded to in Daniel, 
they have a specific purpose. They are for sign. There is a picture. There is a story being told. It's declared in the heavens. It's for the glory of God, of what he's doing down through time and history and even today. But it's also for seasons. We can look up into the heavens. We can understand when springtime is with the spring equinox, with the summer solstice, with the winter solstice and all that. We can tell by where the sun is and what stars are rising at certain time. We can understand the season, what season it is by the heavenly clock too as well. The Bible tells us that the different seasons run like clockwork. The seed time, the harvest, those are ordinances. They have appointed times, appointed cycles that do repeat, that keep going on. And so that's why you can look up into the heavens and understand the time of the seasons, of the appointed times, and of the feasts also that go with the appointed agricultural times as well for the first fruits that relate to the seasons, the seed time and the harvest. And the celestial heavens are also again for days and years for understanding the time. And so when you understand the time, you also understand the season for the proper time for planting and sowing, and then also the best time for harvesting too. But you also know the hours of the day. During the day with the sun, you also know the time at night. And that's how they would understand the time at night when the sundial is not working. You can tell what time it is when you know where the sun is, what time of year it is, and then what stars will be rising at different times, divisions of the night. You can know what time it is at night even when you look and use God's celestial clock. And that's what the ancient people were familiar with. And so this is interesting when we consider where we are right now, understanding the season, that it is past the harvest time, understanding it is early summer. But we also look at what was the ancient understanding using a celestial clock, what was the understanding of when summer really arrived. There's the astronomical start of summer, and that's the summer solstice, and that's when they would understand summer at the beginning. But it's also very well known in ancient times of when the hottest time of summer, when summer really arrived, and they knew when that certain season was, when they knew the certain celestial time. And it was a very marked point of where the sun was along the ecliptic. But it's also connected to Sirius. It was related to the first time that Sirius rose up above the horizon, the first time it was seen above the horizon, right before sunrise. And that was a helical rising of Sirius. And to the ancient people, this particular moment when that happened, it marked the hottest point of the summer, and that the 20 days before that were going to be the hottest, and the 20 days after this moment were going to be the hottest. So they had a very good understanding of the celestial clock when the hottest time of the summer was. And that's why they called it the dog days of summer, the hottest time of summer, that's where that saying comes from, when the star Sirius, which is from the constellation, the dog, when that would rise at the same time as the sun. That just coincided with the hottest time of the summer, and they put two and two together. And so they understood when that time would come on the celestial clock, and they could tell it was coming up. So they would know, and they'd be able to plan their harvest, and also their vacation times and all that, they'd be able to plan that accordingly. When they knew the extreme heat of summer was coming up, that approximate time of the hottest of summer, the dog days of summer. Now, another reason they equated Sirius with the hottest time of summer was they viewed Sirius as a hot star. And if you've ever gone out at night and looked at Sirius, it's very bright. It even twinkles very much. It's almost like it's burning with fire. And so that's what they saw. They saw a very bright burning star. And they said, well, it must be hot because it looks like it's burning. So when you have the sun, which is already hot, and another star that is, in their minds, burning hot, when both of them were rising at the same time, to them it made sense that that's why the days were extra hot. That's what they saw it as because Sirius did look very hot. And we also have to keep in mind, back around the time of Christ even, Sirius was a different color. Sirius today is a very cool blue color. It's still very bright, still twinkles and shines bright. But today it's a bluish color, kind of a cool color. So for us today, it doesn't have that hot, fiery impression that it did to the ancients. But that was what they understood it to be. And that's what different ancient authors wrote about. They always referred to it as a very hot, fiery, reddish star, Sirius. And they likened it to the shining of a copper shield. It had a reddish color, a ruddy color. And so again, to the ancient people, when they saw the yellowish, orangish, hot sun rising up, and then also a reddish, ruddy, bright star, which was also brighter than any others, to them, it just looked like two balls of fire rising up at the same time, and that's why the summer was so hot. And so, again, that's why they knew, okay, this is the time of year, and they also knew when it was coming up, too, that's going to be a hot time of the year. They knew the season by the celestial clock.
And for us in this time, that's going to be on July 31st. That's when the helical rising of Sirius is going to happen. The first sighting of Sirius right before the sun rises. And when you compare it to the temperature in Israel, it does correlate. So you can see why the ancient people put two and two together. With this year's rising being the last day of July, you could see that it's pretty much right in the middle of the hottest times of the weather in Israel. So there is a real world correlation. It is really the hottest time of the summer, the dog days of summer. The celestial clock can show what season you're in, what's also expected in days ahead. So I've added this to the timeline down at the bottom. So we can have an understanding, what did the average Hebrew person, where they lived even in Israel, when they looked at the celestial clock that God created, what the heavens were declaring about what season was coming up, when Jesus said summer is nigh, what was going through the disciples' heads? Was it just a mere summer solstice? Or was it the hot dog days of summer are coming up? You know when you're in spring and seeing spring bloom and everything put forth, you know the hot times of summer is coming up. Especially when we consider the disciples were mostly fishermen and of course they spent most of their time outdoors anyway. To them, understanding summer was coming up was more of a, it's going to be hot very soon. And they also knew when it was going to be hottest, hottest. So we have to keep that in mind too. What was the ancient understanding when the disciples heard Jesus say, summer is nigh? You know, the hot time is coming up when you know it's springtime. We can see that understanding in the time and context where we are right now. And again, they would understand the 20 days before that astronomical marker of the season and the 20 days after that, those 40 days were considered the dog days of summer, the hottest time, the extreme heat of it, which backs us up to about the 11th of July. They would understand about that time in principle, the hottest time of summer is about to start around the 10th and 11th of July. Of course, it'd be slowly ramping up to it, but it's going to be really hot after that time. And again, that draws our attention to where we are now. We're awaiting our bridegroom. Our bridegroom has told us before, when you look up and lift up your heads and you see all these things that are telling you your redemption draweth nigh, he also, in the same conversation, likened it to the blooming of springtime, tells you that summer is nigh, too. So there's a correlation in that picture. There's a time delay of you will be drawing nigher before you get to what's expected, but the summer was the expected point in the one parallel. And so in the correlation, we see that we are now here at the time that the nigh was drawing to. So we are here where we are expecting the pickup of the purchased possession. The early part of summer is here. We're not nigh anymore to what was pictured. We are here now. So that's why we should not be surprised that also at this time where we have arrived at this early time of summer, but it's not the dog days of summer yet. Here at this time, just before that, is a picture of a bride and a bridegroom. And also shortly before the dog days of summer, the sun lining up with Sirius. The brightest sun lining up with the brightest star in the firmament, reminding us our bridegroom is coming for his wise and faithful bride. Incredible pictures here, while the grapes are still green, the figs are still green. It's not the hottest dog day of the summer yet. This is a time of expectation. This is the time we were told would be drawing nigh. And so we should be excited that we are now here. The time of expectation is now here. This is an incredible time. And on top of that, also, we see again pictures with Jupiter. Jupiter arriving at Station 2 in Libra on July 10th, the day before the dog days of summer. This should catch our attention that there's multiple very important celestial things coming together right here within just a few days. Because remember, when Jupiter is at Station 2, it will appear to stop and stand in that one place for approximately two weeks. So even though Jupiter is going to be stopping on the 10th, really all that time the week before it and the week after that, the entire time Jupiter is going to appear to be standing still. In our Heavens Declare booklet, we talk about Jupiter's unique movements with retrograde and prograde motion and how it moves around in unique loops. And Station 2 is when it's turning direction, apparently, visibly, but it will appear to pause there. It just says it's slowing down and switching direction. It just appears that way. And on page 43, we show how we've been led to this point. Jupiter is the main actor in the story because it represents Shiloh, the scepter, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it's been making its retrograde loop within Libra, but it's coming up to Station 2 on July 10th when it's going to be stopping and changing direction and going back through Libra again. But apparently it's also going to be telling a different story. 
Again, on July 10th, Jupiter is going to be just beyond the rightest main star in Libra, the altar, and it's going to be switching direction and starting to go back toward the left again. But for just those few days, it's going to appear to stop. The king, the scepter, is going to appear to stop. It's gone through the entire picture of Libra. But now when it goes back, now that it has passed over Libra once, when it goes back, it will be passing over Scorpius. Remember, this was the ancient perspective. The right claw of Scorpius came all the way to the rightmost star of Libra. That's where Scorpius started. And they understood that was part of it. So when we see Jupiter on July 10th, it's been moving retrogrades. So it's been moving toward the right. All of a sudden, it's going to be slowing down, appearing to stop. It's going to be apparently moving so slow, it just looks like it's standing still. But then it's slowly picking up speed and then going the other way. And so after July 10th, it's going to start telling the story, really, of Scorpius, which is the next constellation after you pass over Libra. This should catch our attention because we are expecting the story to change. We are expecting, in a sense, the page to be turned to the next chapter. We don't know the future. We can't say it will happen on that day. But we can say, definitely, it's going to be pausing in this time, the days before and the days after. And we know for sure it's going to be starting to pass over the next constellation, which overlaps, which is Scorpius. And again, it should catch your attention that all the signs prior to this and the celestial signs that we've seen have been Leo the Lion, which has been the picture of our Redeemer, and then also Virgo, which has been the fulfillment of the promise of Shiloh. And then we've also seen Libra, the altar, which is why he came, the Lamb of God, to be offered on our behalf. So all the three previous constellations that our attention has been drawn to with Jupiter have been of the promised Redeemer. But it should catch our attention that the very next one deals with the adversary, Scorpius. We should not be surprised to have an expectation of the adversary starting to be involved around this time too, because the heavens do declare a story. It does declare the glory of God, and the adversary being treaded underfoot is part of the story. And we know the Antichrist, the son of perdition, is going to come onto the scene, and it's going to be right after the bridegroom picks up his bride. Very interesting time, this time of turning another page. Again, when we look at the timeline, we see some incredible celestial stories. We see the heavens declaring more to the story that we have already been studying. We are reminded where we are right now. We are reminded of some incredible pictures of the wise, the promises for them, and the bridegroom who's coming for them. Promises for them. We know it's also the early time of summer. It's not the hot time yet. It's not the dog days yet. But we also do see another celestial sign right on top of all this that does allude that there is about to be another king coming. A switch in the story from the Lion of the tribe of Judah to the Antichrist who's coming, the adversary. We should not be surprised that the story is about to change at this time, apparently. Again, we can't say for sure, but that is what the heavens do appear to be declaring. We're familiar with Revelation chapter 5, where the Lamb who was slain on our behalf, where he's pictured as in heaven with his bride before him, and they're talking about, yes, you are the one who redeemed us from every tribe out of every nation. The Gentile bride is pictured as in heaven in Revelation chapter 5. And then chapter 6, with the bride in his presence, the Lamb then takes the scroll and opens the seven seals. And should catch your attention, chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Now there's a lot of different perspectives about these horses. We're not going to go there. But what we do know is the timing of it. The Gentile bride is with the lamb when he opens these. So they are picked up before these are released. And notice that the very first thing that happens that we can understand clearly is a crown is given to this new person who comes onto the scene. It states a crown was given to him. So this is an important picture where we can say for sure there is going to be a kingship, there is going to be an authority given at this point, right after the bridegroom has picked up his bride, immediately after it. The first thing that's going to happen is we know for sure a crown authority is going to be given. There's going to be a new king on earth that's going to come. And he's going to go forth conquering and to conquer. There's going to be war. And 
The next horse blends with that is going to be red. And that's a very distinct characteristic that is given with the war and death and the great sword. And when you continue to read the chapter, it does appear that all four of the horsemen and what's coming really comes concurrently. So you can say it's all coming together, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, how they're often described. They really come all together. And the war and the death and the destruction and the famine and all that really comes as a result of the conquering and the conquer. It all goes together. And it will start with a crown being given. And so this is important when we consider what the heavens are declaring right now and what they do appear to be declaring. Remember, Jupiter is the king planet. That's what it's known as. It pictures the scepter, pictures authority and ruling. And here we are where we see it about to change the story, highlighting the adversary. It does appear that the celestial story is declaring that a crown is about to be given to the adversary. This should catch our attention. Why is Jupiter called the king planet? Genesis 1.14 And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. So on the very first page of the Bible, right after God tells us these lights in the firmament are for signs, they're for seasons, they're for days and years, he goes straight into telling us that there are going to be lights that will rule over the day, that's going to be the sun, the greater light. There's going to be a light that rules over the night and it's going to rule because it's going to be the brightest light and that's going to be the moon it's the brightest light at the night so it kings over all the other lights that are lesser than that light and there's going to be different rankings of them but note that god is the one who associates kingship that there's going to be king lights there's going to be a king light of the day there's going to be a king light of the night and there's a difference between the two greater lights and the stars the stars are separate so there will be a king light of the stars also just by the ranking and this is also why you see astronomers refer to different planets or different stars at different times reigning over the night they'll use that exact phrase because they are lording over their bright they are the brightest one on the scene so they rule over the night they rule over all the other stars they are the most prominent star now venus is the brightest planet in the night sky but you'll notice that it is not out very long. And this is how it is regularly. But you'll notice that Jupiter, which is the next brightest planet, is out all night. It can be out all night. And it is usually out longer than Venus, too. So this is why Jupiter is known as the king planet. Because on average, Jupiter is going to be the one who rules over the night. He's reigning over the night. He's out the longest. He reigns and rules the longest. He's the brightest thing shining, aside from the moon. And the moon's not always visible, has different rising and setting times. So the brightest light on average that's going to be out and visible is going to be Jupiter. That's why astronomers refer to Jupiter as the king planet, because it rules the most. And other planets, such as Mars, can be almost as bright as Jupiter, usually. But we find a very interesting astronomical event in just a few days. Mars brighter in 2018 than since 2003. Remember Mars in 2003? That was the year the red planet came closer to Earth than it had been in some 60,000 years. Mars can be faint, or it can be a bright planet. It can outshine most stars. But in 2003, for a few months, Mars was exceedingly spectacular in our sky, outshining all the stars and planets except brilliant Venus. In 2018, Mars won't be quite as bright as it was in 2003, but nearly. This should catch your attention, the timing of all this, in just a few days, Mars is going to be extra, extra bright, and it's going to be a rare celestial event. According to Alpo, in 2003, Mars came the closest it has ever been in nearly 60,000 years. For a period of about two months, Mars will supplant Jupiter as the fourth brightest celestial body after the Sun, Moon, and Venus. Mars reign as the fourth brightest celestial body, or third brightest in the nighttime sky after the Moon and Venus, will last from about July 7th to September 7th. Notice how they refer to Mars will reign over the night sky during this period, the third brightest in rank after the moon and after Venus. 
And now remember, Venus is not considered the king planet because it does not reign very long at all. So you really jump down to the next contender, which is Jupiter. And usually Jupiter is the king planet because it's out the longest and it doesn't get the competition from Mars, even though Mars can get pretty close. But notice that they are saying Mars, for just this brief period, will actually be brighter than Jupiter, and that it will rain instead of Jupiter. And the peak of this is going to be on July 31st. That's when it's going to peak at its absolute brightest. But during these days ahead, you can see Mars is going to be out just as long as Jupiter, and it will be turning brighter than Jupiter in just a few days, too. The kingship of the night is about to change. Time and date has a nifty little interactive to visualize this. You can see here on July 1st that right now Jupiter is pretty bright. It's negative 2.31 above the baseline, which is 0.0. .0. And right now, Mars is pretty bright. It's at negative 2.16. So right now, Mars is not that far away from Jupiter in brightness. And on July 5th, around there, depending on your time zone, that is when Mars is going to be as equal in brightness as Jupiter and quickly will surpass Jupiter in brightness. By July 6th, Mars will be the new king of the night and will be this way for a number of weeks. This should catch our attention when we see what Jupiter is about to signal with turning the page of the next chapter to the adversary, the scorpion. And at this same time, we see a red planet being crowned king. We know war is coming. We know sun destruction is coming. There's going to be a lot of death and a lot of destruction. The book of Revelation describes all that. And so again, it should catch our attention that the heavens are even going to be declaring for several weeks, peaking at July 31st this time. Mars, the red one, the fiery one, is going to be reigning for a period of time surpassing Jupiter, the king, which has been representing Shiloh for a while. We know the Antichrist, the son of perdition, is coming. And it strongly looks like the heavens are declaring this is about to happen. Again, Mars is going to be outshining all the stars and planets except brilliant Venus, and that's not a contender for the king title. That's normally Jupiter. But by default, it will go to Mars because Mars will be brighter than Jupiter, and it will be raining as long as Jupiter, too, in the night. But it will be brighter. And again, note, they are emphasizing this is an extremely rare event. The last one happened in 2003, and I happen to remember that night because an astronomy club invited us out to go look at it, and it was definitely bright at that time. You could definitely see it. But that was back in 2003, and they emphasized this hadn't happened in 60,000 years before that. So what we're seeing in just a few days is extremely rare, and that, again, stands out when the heavens are declaring something rare and especially the timing and what it represents. The heavens are declaring that a crown is about to be given, a significant one. And so I wanted to understand, how is this in relation to this story that we've seen, what the heavens have declared over our wise men's journey? How unique is this? Has this happened before? And obviously they say it hasn't, but I wanted to see it for myself. So I wanted to chart out the brilliance, and again, Vega is the baseline, that's magnitude 0.0, .0. that's the yellow line. And just looking back through 2015, because that's when our learning journey really started, just for comparison, Sirius is that gray line there, just to give you an idea of how bright things are. And Jupiter, and Jupiter's pretty regular in its cycles, going bright for a while, then dimming relatively, it's still bright. And this is one of the reasons why Jupiter is the king planet, because it always stays pretty bright. Even though Venus is brighter, Jupiter will still stay pretty bright. And so that's why it will always be the king planet as long as it's out at night. And so for comparison, I plotted Mars. Now these points are only from the first of the month, so that's why it's a little jagged. Sometimes it goes a little brighter, just at opposition times, but these are from the first of the month. Going back to the start of 2015. And we can see that there was a time when Mars came very close to being as bright as Jupiter, but there is still a significant gap in the brightness. But in just a few days, at the same time as Jupiter is out too, and it will be outshining Jupiter while both are out. So it will be ruling over Jupiter in the night sky. It will be the prominent one and will be definitely brighter than Jupiter too. You can see during that time period, Jupiter is actually going to be getting relatively less brighter on the downslope. So again, this catches our attention. We've seen Jupiter through the lion. We've seen Jupiter through the woman. We've seen Jupiter through Libra. All the positive aspects of our Redeemer. But now we're at a point where we're expecting the story to change. We should not be surprised at all that we see the heavens declaring a new crown is going to be given on earth to the earthly ruler, while the lamb who is ruling up in heaven, while well, he has his bride up there. We should not be surprised at all that the heavens are doing this because this is the expected next chapter in the story. 
Now, Jupiter isn't always visible. They're time with the solar conjunctions, so I'm just going to wipe those out. And you can see it really doesn't affect any part of the story. Jupiter is out right now. Mars is out right now. Right now, Jupiter is king of the night. But very soon, in just a few days, Mars will take that title. And when we look back on learning journey as the end of June, the start of July, that's when we saw the first star of Bethlehem with the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And then shortly after that, we saw the second one with Jupiter and Venus. And then we saw Jupiter at opposition. That's the first time that we really noticed it. It always happens, but that's the first time we noticed it. And that was when we noticed it in context as taking place right by the rear foot of Leo the Lion, which reminded us of the Shiloh prophecy and really opened our eyes to what the heavens were declaring. It told us what the story was, it told us the prophecy, it told us the promise about the one who would come, and then more celestial signs with a third conjunction of Jupiter and Venus, very rare one as well. Multiple things drawing our attention that the heavens were declaring something we needed to pay attention to. And it was a story that was going to be drawn out over a while, too. So we saw the third one. And then approximately November, December of 2016, that's when Jupiter entered the side of Virgo and started the pregnancy picture there. And the start of the Revelation 12 sign is merely the fulfillment of the Shiloh prophecy. It's still part of the Shiloh prophecy. It's showing how what was prophesied would be fulfilled. You have to have both. And so the Revelation 12 sign is the sign of the Son of Man, the promised one who would come, who was promised to Jacob. And then we notice the opposition the second time, right in the middle of the pregnancy cycle, reaffirming it's the king, it's the light of the world, right there in the middle of the pregnancy even. And of course, on September 23rd was the Revelation 12 sign that most people are familiar with, and extended just a few days beyond that too as well. But again, it should catch our attention. That entire story was told during a visible time of the story. And you could have seen the Revelation 12 sign if you got up before the morning. You'd be able to see the stars on the right side of the sun. And then you just eat lunch and have dinner and then wait till the sun goes down. You'll be able to see the stars and the events on the other side of the sun. So it's a visible event. Most people don't talk about it that way. The whole thing was visible. You just wouldn't see it at one moment. But you would see it in one day if you watched it. And then recently, at opposition again, we noticed how it was drawing attention to Libra, the altar, which was the entire reason the Redeemer came. The promised one who would be born of a woman, Shiloh, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God. So we saw the entire story, literally, visibly. We took pictures of it along the journey. We showed it. We talked about it. It's in the booklet, Heavens Declare. It's all visible. We were able to look up. We lift up our heads. The heavens were declaring, you're a redeemer, you know the story? Your redeemer is nigh, he's very nigh, he's coming to pick you up. And just recently, at the time of opposition, we talked about that was the sum of the story. That was the understood sum of the story, that he came to offer himself on our behalf. That is the sum. Then he went up to heaven, sat down at the right hand of God, until his enemies be made his footstool. That's where the story stops. And we know from prophecy and revelation where the story's going to pick back up again. So that's why we've been expecting the next chapter to start, which is a chapter that's going to be in the future. And it's going to be picking up with his enemies coming onto the scene, being crowned, having their short little reign during the tribulation time, and then he's going to crush them at the end. So we know what the next chapter is, and we see the heavens even declaring that now. This is why we know our redemption draweth nigh, because we know the story. We know scripture, and we see it being declared in the heavens. It should catch our attention that in just a few days, Jupiter is going to be at station two stopping, pausing. It's gone through Libra. It's shown the story of the offering, the altar, literally just right before Mars comes onto the scene. This should get your attention. The heavens are declaring a new king is about to be crowned, and that is the expected next chapter in the story, too. The heavens do declare the glory of God. We've seen so much that they have already declared, but we can look up into the heavens even right now and see the heavens declaring still the same story, the continuation of it, and what's coming up. We know this is the time. This is a high time of expectation. We know sudden destruction is coming. We see in the news so many talks of peace with Korea and Israel, the Middle East. Think about that. The two greatest dilemmas of peace that this generation has known, the Koreas and the Middle East, both of them being talked about at the same time in this 70th anniversary of Israel time too as well, the fig tree prophecy and all that. This is a time when we have heard those calls for peace and safety. We know what comes next. The Bible even tells us. Sudden destruction is coming. The red horse of war is coming. The white horse is coming too. There's going to be war coming. When you hear that, you know it's coming. We can look up into the heavens and it's telling the same thing. A red horse is coming, but right after our Redeemer comes.
These are the promises we review when we look at what the heavens are declaring, when we look at where we are right now, when we look at the agricultural pictures, when we look at the historical pictures, when we look at the biblical pictures, we see this time right now, we're here. Early summer is here. The nigh is over. We're here. We should be expecting him any moment. We know time is short, but we also know his promises are sure. Down at the bottom of the timeline, I have bracketed when Mars is going to rain over the night instead of Jupiter. And that's going to start around July 5th, 6th. And again, looking in context, everything else is going on at that time. At that exact same time too. I mean, within days, within hours even. The bridegroom, the sun, pictured with Sirius, the brightest star. The wise, the faithful servants. At the same time, Jupiter, representing the scepter, is also standing still. The story is pausing. The story is about to change, folks. And then at the same time, we have a picture of another king being crowned. This should catch our attention. We should wake up, realize the hour is very, very late, and it should also sober us. What we know is coming next. Sun destruction is coming. Do we know the time? Do we know our bridegroom cometh? Are we going out to meet him? He's given us the encouragement. He's given us the wisdom. Run for a prize. You know the time. You know your bridegroom's coming. Run toward him. Run toward him. Finish strong. He apprehended you. Apprehend him. Rise up. Trim your lamps. Shine bright. And go out to meet the bridegroom. This is a time when we need to be vigilant. We need to be sober. We need to be focused. We need to be having our eyes on the prize. Our eyes on eternity. Our heart and affection set on things above. Rising up and drawing close to our Redeemer even now. This is the picture he gives us even now. In scripture and in the heavens. Even now we know he's nigh even at the doors. Let's rise up. Let's trim our lamps. Let's shine bright and let's run out to meet our Redeemer. And let's love him, and let's serve him, first and highest above all else. Maranatha.